Gin seemed to have always sort of been a part of my life in one way or another before I knew it or not. You know, even back to when I was 14 years old and I had, I guess, my sort of first gin experience. Um, I was out with my brother and his friend. His friend was really into like black magic and ghosts and all this stuff. And he's like, let's go to this place called like Spirit Corner or something like that. So we went there, uh, we were sitting down in a circle and he started doing like, I don't know, whatever seance or chant or whatever. And I felt this feeling um, inside my chest, sort of where you think your soul might be in the center of your chest. And it really scared me, but I didn't say anything. I just kept quiet. And he looked straight at me and said, you need to leave. And I'm like, why? <laughs> but I knew why, I could feel it. And he's like, something here doesn't like you. Just leave, run. So I got up and I ran like as fast as I could away from there and straight back home. I never really thought about this again until almost a decade later. My revert story started back when I was about 21 years old and I was living in Malaysia. I had just moved into a new house and my best friend was over from Canada uh, helping me move in. So we decided to have like a housewarming party, invite some friends over, have a barbecue. And uh, we had all the doors open. Um, typical Malaysian houses, they'll have like the wooden swinging door and the glass sliding door at the front of the house. Um, I'd taken my friends upstairs to see the house, see the rooms upstairs. And as we came out of one of the bedrooms, um, I heard a bang and I heard my dog bark downstairs. So I went downstairs and I saw my best friend and she just looked absolutely terrified. She was like pale white and just staring at the glass sliding door at the front of the house. And I asked her what had happened and she said my dog was walking towards the door and the glass door just slammed shut right in front of the dog. So, you know, logically, scientifically, that shouldn't happen. The wooden door would close if it was wind or something like that. But the glass door shouldn't do that. So we got kind of freaked out, um, locked up the house and just like went out and sort of forgot that it had ever happened. My best friend left. I was living in that house and over the next couple of months between um, sort of like February and March, um, things kept happening in the house, but I kept making excuses for them. So I would come home and something I had left over there was now over there. I'd just tell myself like, I forgot, I moved it. Or I'd hear something drop in my room and I'd look around and nothing had dropped, nothing had moved. So I thought maybe it's just the neighbor and I would just ignore it. And then one night I couldn't ignore <laughs> what was happening. I came home, uh, it was quite late, like 11 or 12 o'clock at night. I went to my bedroom, I put my dog in her bedroom and I started to get ready for bed. I looked outside sort of at the crack of my door and I saw that the hallway light was still on outside. So I went outside to turn it off and when I went outside, I felt that feeling that I had told you about in the beginning when it happened to me when I was 14. Exact same feeling. The minute I felt it, I remembered that time. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't really hear anything. Maybe something like white noise, which sounds like a bit like a fan, like, but very faint. And I felt this feeling, but I could feel like where this feeling was coming from, like the energy, where it was coming from. And I got really scared, so I just shut my door and I locked my door. And as I turned around to go to my bed, something hit the door so hard behind me. The whole door shook and I just got terrified. My heart fell on the floor. I didn't know what to do because I couldn't see it. I couldn't fight it. I couldn't do anything. At this time, I was an atheist, a very strong atheist who used to tell my friends like they're crazy for believing that there's some man in the sky who's created everything. And, you know, I've been in many situations where like, you know, life or death, or you're like afraid, but I never thought to call on God or, or any kind of like deity in any of those sort of situations because I just didn't believe that it would help. But in that moment, my mind was totally blank except for one word. And that word was Allah. So against like sort of my normal reaction, I asked God, I asked Allah to help me. 
and I went to bed and I put something on the laptop to kind of like distract my mind and I fell asleep so quickly like abnormally quick for me and I remember that night it rained it rained so much it like purified everything around me and when I woke up I sat on my bed and I made what would be my first dua and I asked well first of all I said Allah thank you if that was you who helped me um, and protected me from anything further last night and if you want me to be Muslim if you want me on this path then you have to guide me because nobody has been able to convince me that you exist before now after that I felt very interested in learning about Islam I started asking the Muslims that I knew about the religion, about why they prayed, what they were afraid from, what does Allah want from us. And I started to beta test Islam in my life. Over the next few months, Allah started to prepare me to become Muslim because my lifestyle was not Islamic at all before that. Um, and I had a lot of things to change to get to a point where I can call myself a good Muslim, inshallah. Um, so like I quit drinking and um, I started to practice like implementing patience, for example, when, when I feel impatient, when I feel irritated, maybe in a traffic jam. And so I would say, you know, uh, Allah loves patience and those who are patient, so like be patient. And then I would see like the situation changing. So I kept putting these sort of tests in my life and then um, probably about six, seven months after that first incident, uh, it was coming to be Ramadan and all of my Muslim friends were very, very good Muslims in Ramadan. So I decided um, this is the time to see if I can be Muslim or not because from my personality, I don't do things halfway. I like to do them all the way or not at all. And I didn't want to be a Ramadan Muslim. I didn't want to only practice Islam during one month of the year. So if I was going to do it, I was going to do it all year. So I needed to know, can I, can I be this? Can I fulfill all the duties of a Muslim? So I started fasting from the first day of Ramadan. I read a chapter or a Jews of the Quran every day. I put on a hijab during that month um, and I learned to pray. And uh, it was very difficult. <laughs> learning how to pray and putting the um, papers in front of you and I was completely on my own so I didn't really have anyone in that month to guide me except Allah which is quite suiting because from the beginning the whole journey was kind of just me and Allah and so it was coming to be the middle of Ramadan and I'd been fasting the whole month and I'd been praying the whole month and reading the Quran you know I was about 15 juz in and I kept reading about myself, you know, the, the, the blind and the deaf who are exposed to the truth. They know it's the truth, but their arrogance turns them away. And it was one night at Isha prayer. I thought to myself, if I died tonight, I'm not going to Jannah. I'm one of these people that Allah keeps warning us about. So I Googled. How do you say your Shahada in English? And I sat there on my prayer mat after Isha prayer and I said my Shahada between me and Allah. So just as jinn were involved in my life when I was a teenager and then as a young adult and then SubhanAllah now again <laughs> as a more mature adult, the jinn Subhanallah, you know, they're one, the jinn and the shayateen, you know, their one duty is to kind of drive us away from Allah, to drive us towards the jahiliyyah. And every time they seem to try to do this, uh, it drives me closer to Allah, alhamdulillah. Um, so most recently I went on Umrah. And while I was on Umrah, I learned a lot, alhamdulillah, by the will of Allah, by the guidance of Allah about the jinn, about the shayateen and how they affect and manipulate and disrupt our lives. And I, I was so blissfully unaware of the impact that they were having on my life and how little I was doing to protect myself against those sort of things.
what we do in our lives, what we don't do in our lives, can make us vulnerable to their manipulation, to their effects in our lives. What we post on social media, what we share with people, how we share information with people, you know. Often there's a very thin line between wanting to share your happiness and kind of gloating about what you've been given. And these are the very, very gentle lines that we have to kind of walk every day. And so, by the will of Allah, I was, I was taught about these things and how they were affecting my life. And to do so, to, to help myself against these things, to protect myself against these things, I started to implement more things in my life. You know, most importantly, your adhkar, morning and evening, is so important. Adding extra types of ibadah in your daily life, dhikr, all of these things, very important. And before I went on Umrah, I owned one niqab, and I had used it for filming before. And when I was packing for Umrah, I just got this thought in my mind, pack your niqab. I was like, why? <laughs> I had no reason to wear it. I wasn't thinking about wearing it, but it's just a small piece of fabric, so I just threw it in my bag anyway, because the thought had come to me. While I was on Umrah and I was exposed to all of these situations and given this knowledge, alhamdulillah, the thought came again to my mind. Put on your niqab. Which was really weird because I've never thought about wearing niqab in my life. Like I've always thought it makes me feel claustrophobic, I'm going to hate it. So I asked the sheikh I was with, did he think that this would help, you know, help me be closer to Allah, help add another layer of protection against the jinn and the shayateen. And he said, yeah, of course, it's a, it's a way of, you know, worshipping your Lord. And all of this is positive. I asked a couple of my friends I was with and they all, you know, said, why don't you try it out? So I was in Saudi, I thought might as well try it out here. It's so easy to wear it here compared to anywhere else. And I put it on and I hated it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. The first couple of days was horrible for me. The shayateen were working so hard to get me to not do it. I felt ugly, I felt invisible. The people on my Umrah trip didn't recognize me anymore, so they stopped talking to me when I was, you know, with my group of friends. They would literally skip me because they didn't know who I was. And I just felt so irrelevant. And I was like, why am I feeling this so strongly? And then I realized that all of these feelings were stemming from my ego from my want to be seen and none of that is a healthy thing and that's not from a healthy place so that was kind of the last push I needed to keep it on because I was like the jinn and the shayateen they manipulate the parts of us that are weak and if my ego is making me weak then I have to try to kill it um, so, alhamdulillah, I decided from that moment that I wasn't going to take it off. And I feel like so many parts of my life that were being affected before are significantly decreased in that. I don't feel like those parts are so easily manipulated or twisted or affected anymore. Alongside keeping up with my fard worship, and adding, you know, sunnah worships when I can and different acts of ibadah. And that's why I decided to put on the niqab. Alhamdulillah, jazakallah khairan for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.